Hello. How are you today? Good, good. Well, I, I hope you guys perk up because this talk is going to be about happy living and happiness. So, um, for really nice to see some familiar faces out there today. Um, and as he said, my name is Jessica Calgron. Um, how many of you, by a show of hands, have ever felt like there was more to the life you're living? Anybody? Felt like there had to be something else, right? Good. I, I see a few. Um, well, this is what this is about. That's a really natural feeling, to feel like there has to be something else out there. And a few years ago, I found myself thinking this very same thing. Um, and what actually inspired me to do this talk, to pick this topic, um, was meeting so many people that are living without a purpose and also because I found myself asking myself that there had to be something more. Um, so I set on a path to change that in my life. So, and now um, I have this sense of total fulfillment and I want to talk to you about that. So you know that, that feeling uh, of feeling like you're living exactly the kind of life that you want to live? To me, that's what the life of full is about. And when I came to Guangzhou, I came about, this is going to be my second year in Guangzhou, my third year in Korea, and I felt that sense of synergy here, that I was using all my talents, and I was living a very full life. I was living the life lived full. So I want to share the stories of what I've done, um, stories and research I've encountered, and two of my main sources are actually this. I want to highly recommend them to you. Um, a lot of the ideas that I'm going to share are not just my own. Um, a lot of them come from this documentary called Happy. Excellent, excellent documentary about happy living and what it takes to live a full life. And also this book called The Power of Giving and how giving enriches us all. So those are my two main sources. Um, so. The Life Lived Full is about the attitude of happiness. It's about finding what you're good at. It's about using your skills, your talents, and your abilities, and finding ways to give yourself away so you can better contribute to the world and your community around you. So my purpose for this talk is actually to answer uh, a question that I always get asked. People always ask me, why are you so happy? So <laughs> hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll know the answer to that. Also, I want to share with you the benefits of giving um, and the great benefits that you can bring into your life and give to the lives of others when you give. And hopefully, I want to inspire you to live a fuller life through that. So, first is my story. This is a picture of my mom and dad. I found it on my, I was just home in America in January, and I found this when I was digging through old boxes, and I loved it. It was a moment of, uh, a moment of bliss. As you can see, they were all happy. I come from a pretty happy family. Um, my dad is, is a very joyful person, and I think he passed that down to me. Um, so I grew up a pretty happy kid. I was pretty involved in church, in my community growing up, uh, when I was younger and throughout adulthood. And I moved out of my parents' house when I went to college. I got a house. I had a great job. And I guess, in some ways, I was living the dream. Um, and I was happy, but I always still felt like there was more that I had to accomplish, that there was more I could give, more ways I could serve, that I wasn't really using all of my skill set. And I knew that there was more ways to contribute, but I didn't know how. I found myself asking, how can I get this contribution? How can I give more? And the reason really is, I guess, because I hadn't found my life's calling or my life's purpose. And that's really important to find, um, to live a happy life. So I spent about eight years in training and recruiting. Um, and I'll share a quick story about my first presentation. I never, I'll never forget what it was like the first time I gave a presentation. I was working uh, for a nutritional beverage company. And it was a great product, great company. And I remember at the end of doing what I was doing, seeing people light up and get so excited. Uh, I remember going home and thinking, I can't believe they paid me to do this, <laughs> because it was really fun and I had total joy from that. Um, 
I loved that feeling of getting people inspired. And years later, when I was looking at how I could live a fuller life, I went back to that feeling. I went back to that memory that I had when I experienced that full joy. Um, and I realized that inspiring others and sharing with others really made me happy. So I want to talk about happiness. So what is happiness? <laughs> As you can see, there's this awesome picture of a dog. Uh, when most people are asked what they want in life, the most common answer is they want to be happy. But what does that mean? Um, we want to be happy. You remember when you were a kid and you had so much joy? And you see little kids nowadays and they're so... Usually you don't see an unhappy kid. And if he is unhappy, it's very temporary. But they experience all this joy, right? And I want to show you this quick video. Um, this is a little, little kid. I, I saw this video on YouTube and I thought it was so cute. Uh, this little kid saw bubbles for the first time, and this is his reaction. <laughs> Super cute, huh? <laughs> He just experienced all this joy. So little kids are so happy. And when we're small, for the most part, most of us are very happy. And as we get older, we kind of, something changes. We, we lose that feeling of complete joy, like when we see bubbles, right? And what an interesting, uh, an interesting statistic that I came across in uh, the book, The Power of Giving, is that kids laugh over 150 times a day. Isn't that crazy? 150 times a day. And adults, conversely, laugh 15 times a day. So there's a big disconnect between what we're doing when we're little and what we're doing as adults. And of course, laughter shows how happy you are. So why this change? Why aren't most people happy now? There's a lot of benefits to happiness. So the question of why we aren't happy is, is a good question. When you're happy, you have better relationships. Studies show that people that are happier have better relationships. They make more money. They reach more goals. They do better at work. And they even bounce back from adversity faster. And for those of you that don't know what adversity is, when you have trouble or difficult times, they're able to come back from that quicker. They still feel those emotions, you know, but Instead of someone, you know, they might, someone might stub their toe and then that ruined their day, right? They're angry all day and they don't know why, what was the reason. But happy people, generally, they feel that emotion, they get it out and it's done. They move on to the next one and have a great day. So, why aren't we happy? Um, in America, today, society is two times wealthier than what we used to be like 50 years ago. And happiness has stayed stagnant. And some people might say that this is because of the media and how, or how our society has changed. I mean, we're always, we always see images in magazines and in TV and in newspapers about what happiness means, what happiness is supposed to look like, what success is supposed to look like. Um, in TV, it tells us about what it means to be happy. In the magazines, we see articles about the secrets to a happy life or the secrets to a happier marriage, right? Because there are secrets out there, right? And we're told over and over that if we buy more, we spend more, we get that flat screen TV, we'll be happier. So essentially, we're told in society today that happiness is more money, more status, and a better image. Right? And so we're told that money equals happiness. So whether or not you agree with this statement, that's what our society tells us. Right? So what we've seen throughout history, that people with money not, aren't necessarily happy. Um, this is a famous picture of Britney Spears, a really successful singer who went through some hard times and shaved off her hair. Um, and again, Mel Gibson, as you guys know. Um, so, I'm sure there's those of you that know people at home um, that have these amazing jobs with great money 
and they still aren't happy. And there's this really good quote on, uh, by this author, Daniel Gilbert, the author of Stumbling on Happiness. He says, anybody who says money doesn't buy happiness should go talk to someone living under a bridge. But anybody who says money buys happiness should go talk to Bill Gates. Neither of those things are actually true. When money buys you out of the burdens of homelessness, of not knowing when your next meal, where your next meal is going to come from, it changes your happiness dramatically. But once you have your basic needs met, more money doesn't seem to buy more happiness. A pretty profound statement, right? So we spend all this time focusing on external things of money, image, and status. And it's never really enough. And we have this mentality, like shown here, that no matter what season, <laughs> you're never happy, right? And we're always chasing that proverbial carrot that once we reach a certain goal, then I'll be happy. Or once I get this, I'll be happy. But it's never really enough for, for us. Um, but it's the opposite with people who don't have enough. Um, and they're so happy. And I had this experience. I went to India, uh, to Mumbai, to Chusas Avo. And I spent two weeks there uh, taking cooking classes which was amazing, and also taking a tour of one of the poorest slums in India. And it was, I took a tour with a nonprofit to see these slums, and it was exactly like what I thought it would be like, but worse. I've never in my life seen poverty like that, up close and personal, and it became so real. Um, people, were living in these conditions. I remember in these slums, uh, you know, we send our recycling away, we put it in a nice blue bin, and it goes so somewhere where the recycling fairies take them. Well, in Mumbai, a lot of these things that we recycle um, were there, piled up in these slums, old TVs. It, it was, I've never seen anything like it. And amidst all that, people were living in like, these tiny, tiny homes, a whole family uh, living in this very small, very maybe eight by eight feet um, for a family, a, a mom, a dad, and children, um, having curtains for a door. And they were living very humbly. But one thing that struck me a lot was how happy they were and how willing and how giving they were to me people that had so little and were filled with so much joy and they were willing to share what they had. Um, and I saw this not only in the slums but around in, with other people that I encountered. They, you know, when, when people have to struggle to come up with two dollars for a meal or they have to struggle to come up with money just to get a beautiful new dress and yet they give it to you so willingly because you're their new friend. It's so touching and so humbling on so many levels. And I encountered that there. And I, it really made me look at happiness a different way, that you, people like this that may not have a lot, they're filled with all this joy. So I want to share some facts about happiness. Um, happy people usually have a close network of supportive family and friends. And happy people experience a synergy between knowing what their purpose is in life, using their skills and their talents, and being able to give, this attitude of giving. And they experience flow on a regular basis. Now this concept of flow is actually when it's the act of being in the zone of being completely focused and engaged in whatever task you're doing. And studies show that people that experience flow more often are happier than people that don't. So for example, some people can get flow from uh, gardening when they're there in the zone, uh, digging in the earth, and they're totally focused. Um, some people get this from things like surfing, when they're out there catching that perfect wave and they're one with the wave. And people have even found that 
people experience this flow in even things like food service shops, like McDonald's. When people that have been doing food service and they know what they're doing and they're grilling that burger just so, they experience that feeling of flow as well. So flow is different for everybody. For me, uh, I usually experience my flow when I'm singing. I sing as well. And there's nothing like when I'm there and the music is on and I get completely lost in the song I'm singing. It's that feeling of just being in the zone and it's different for everybody. So it's about finding what puts you in flow and where you get your flow from. So happiness can also be derived from work. And here, uh, <laughs> as you guys can see, I'm sure you've, you've met people that have jobs that seem amazing, but they're not happy. They have these amazing cars, and on paper, they're living the dream, but it's not really enough. And there's this really good quote uh, that touched me. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to ruin this movie for everybody if you haven't seen it. Uh, I saw this movie, The Repo Men, and what this movie is actually about is about uh, being able to, if you need organs, being able to get an organ transplant or an organ donation and have to pay a fee, like paying for a credit card. But the problem in this movie is if you didn't pay, for your organ, your eyes, or whatever, they would come and repossess it and take it back. So this guy here, he was actually one of the repo men. Um, and he would go and get organs back, and he was very cold and heartless. And he goes through certain experiences for him uh, that he ends up changing. And there's a part in the movie where he has this realization that the life that he's been living has been the wrong kind of life to lead. And he said this quote that really touched me. He said, this is a cautionary tale. I hope that you might learn from my mistakes. Because in the end, a job is not just a job. It's who you are. And if you want to change who you are, you have to change what you do. When I heard this, it meant a lot to me because I had a great job, I loved my job, I was good at it, but I wanted to do something more meaningful. And that's why I love what I do now. I love teaching at university. I love that feeling of having students light up and get it. I love having that privilege of being able to inspire them. And every day I wake up and I go to work and it's fun for me, it's not work. I love it. And uh, it, was, it was a great change to go from corporate to this, where I'm doing something with my job that's a little more meaningful. And it's the same with you. We, put, we spend so much of our time working, and it's about finding something that you're good at. But you'll be surprised that actually your job is only a very small part of your happiness. Uh, and I think you'll be surprised by this next statistic. Uh, in the happy documentary, they said that 50% of happiness is actually determined by our genes. They said that your base happiness, uh, of where your happiness is at, at its base, is genetic. And 10%, only 10% is actually determined by circumstances. <coughs> and those circumstances are things like your job, the amount of money that you make, your health, and your social status. And 40%, what made up a really big part of how happy you were, is in intentional activity. So things that we do on a regular basis to be happier, and the variety, the amount of variety that we have in our lives. So society really focuses a lot nowadays on money, on status, and on image. So we focus a lot on the external things, but we're actually doing that at the expense of not focusing on the internal psychological needs that we have. So some of these internal needs are things like personal growth, our need for relationships and community, and the desire to help and to give. And I'm going to focus on giving. Um, and I'm going to focus on giving today. So. 
The, when you focus on these needs, on the internal needs, it's a lot more meaningful. And it's, it's a lot more meaningful than money, status, and image. And I want to give a quick story on uh, Japan. Uh, Japan is a very perfect example of focusing on external needs and not necessarily being happier. Um, they actually have a word for this. Uh, in Japan, uh, they experienced tremendous economic growth in the recent decades, and they have a word for overworking. It's called karoshi, and it's death from overworking. And in Japan, um, I was watching this documentary where this man, it was his birthday, and they asked him, what are you going to do? And he said, oh, it's my birthday, but uh, I have to go to work. Oh. And <laughs> they asked him, uh, don't you have a girlfriend? You know, don't you want to spend time with, with a significant other? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I have a girlfriend, but she understands. I got to work. I'll hang out with her another day. Uh -huh. And there was so, you know, it, it was so impacting to hear that, um, that they focus so much on working that it's so polarized. Like, we can't be this polarized only focusing on those things. We need to focus on the internal things. So, let's talk a little bit about giving. Giving breaks down to three things. Your time, your talent, and your treasure. And treasure is money <laughs> by how you use it, right? And most people think of giving as uh, giving money. And <laughs> this is a cute little cartoon strip uh, about giving more. Uh, but there are more things that you can do other than giving money. It's not just that. So. This is why it's really important to find what your purpose is in life because without your purpose, without knowing what your purpose is, you're not living your full potential. And purpose is found through service to others and by connecting with other people and using what you're good at and, what you, and doing things that you enjoy. So I want to share how I'm using my time, my talent, and my treasure and maybe that could inspire you to think about how you can use yours. When I first came to Guangzhou, I decided from the beginning that I wanted to give more of myself in however I could. I knew that I was going to be working at a university, and with that comes a little less teaching hours, and I would have more time to do more things, and I wanted to do something that was more productive and a better, better use of, of me. And now, since, for those of you that know me, since I've been in Guangzhou, I've never been busier. Uh, I'm sometimes hard to get in touch with, but I can also say I've never been happier. Um, happiness, this, these images that you're looking at here, this is actually M-Dream, Mudong um, Yubama. It's an orphanage, um, or a children's home on, in Ulundong in Guangzhou. And when I, I had decided, actually, I got involved with them my first night in Guangzhou. I was in Home Plus, and I met this wonderful kid who was so willing to help me. I, was, I had just spent 30 hours on a plane, and I was tired. I was looking for a converter. And he said, well, let me help you, in his limited English. And he had a friend who knew more English, so he gave me the phone. And it turns out this friend was the director of this children's home. And he actually ended up coming out and giving me a little informal tour of Guangzhou and being completely helpful and so overwhelmingly kind to me. And what was great that came from this was I ended up getting involved with this home. Now, most people think when they think of volunteering and giving time in Korea, you think, I gotta teach more English, right? And I knew for me, that was work, and I wanted to do something different. So, what I actually ended up doing is, I, on Friday nights, I decided to volunteer my time uh, doing something that I enjoy. I have two older brothers, and they're both artists. I am not an artist, but I enjoy art, and I like getting my hands dirty and coming up with a painting that's nowhere near as nice as my brothers, who actually, one of them does this for a living. Uh, but that was something I enjoyed and I wanted to do. So what I ended up doing was getting involved with M-Dream every Friday, 
and teaching art to the kids. And they would learn English through art, of course. And they loved it. And a lot of people that met me after that would ask me, well, how could you give up your Friday nights? I mean, do you go every Friday? <laughs> and I would. And the funny thing is that most people think of Friday as, ah, oh, it's the beginning of the weekend. I can go home. I can relax. I can go have fun. And for me, even though it was the end of a very busy and tiring work week, I looked forward to this time with these kids. It was fun. It was the highlight of my week uh, to get to spend time with them. And I don't know who learned more, them or me, because they gave me so much joy from just being with them and spending time with them. Um, so that was how I decided to use my time. But there's other things that you can do as well. Um, I also, with talent and treasure, with talent, I looked at what am I good at? And sometimes you have to sit down and think about the different skills you have, the different things you like, the different things you're naturally good at. And sometimes unless you don't sit down and you think about it, they won't come to mind. Uh, one thing I decided to do was I wanted to do more singing. And I decided if I am asked and I am available, I will go. And that became my policy. And I started getting invited to do different singing uh, gigs. And it was great to get to touch people through music, through another way and another part of me. Uh, also, with treasure, I was a business major before I changed my major to communications. And one principle that I found was of this giving 10% of what you have. Now, whether or not you're religious, because this is also a religious principle, but it's in business books, and they talk about giving a part of your income to charity or charitable purposes. Now, Rick Warren is the author of The Purpose Driven Life. He's a best-selling author of this internationally best-selling book about living your best life. And he gave this really inspiring TED Talk that inspired me. Um, he was talking about giving money away and giving 10%. Now this guy, he started out giving 10% of his money away. And every year with his wife, when they got married, they decided they would give away 1% more every year. Now that sounds like a lot, 10%. Some people think, whoa, I don't know if I could part with that. And now he's living very well. He has this best-selling book, has had all these amazing things come into his life. And he gives away 90% of his money to charity and lives off of 10% and lives very well. And the reason he said he did this was because when you give, it breaks materialism's hold on you. And for me, that made a lot of sense, and it inspired me to do it as well. Now, I'm not at 90%, <laughs> but uh, it inspired me to start at 10 and to give. Now, Rick Warren, uh, this author, he had this principle. Uh, if you ever get the chance to look him up at, on TED.com, he has this great, great talk. And he has this principle talking about what's in your hand. And that means... A big, chunk of, a big chunk of happiness comes from intentional activity, of things you do on purpose to make yourself happy. So it's about taking inventory. So I want to ask you today, take inventory of what you like, what your talents are, what your skills are, and what you're good at. Then look to see what you can do now, now with what you have for someone else in the next 30 days. And it's about what you can do right now. And that's what this principle of what's in your hand is about. About what you can do right now, in this moment, with what you have. You don't need to wait until later with what you have now, whether it be your time, your talent, or your treasure, to make a difference. So when you give, the awesome thing about giving is that when you give, you make yourself happy and you make other people happy too. I'm a testament to that. I can tell you that it brings me great joy when I do it, because I found for me, um, the answer to why I'm so happy is really about having this attitude of giving. It, the secret to happiness really is found in service to others, and I really believe that. And my, uh, a very wise person I know, also known as my dad, <laughs> once told me something that really impacted me, and I want to share it with you. He said, 
Uh, one day we were talking on the phone and he said this. Uh, he said, life is about the other person. If you meet the needs of others, your needs will be met too. And that is so true. And I remember when he said that, I wrote it down and I've never forgotten it. So I challenge you today to look at what's in your hand. What's in your hand now? How can you make a difference? How can you impact those people around you and in turn impact, bring this amazing happiness to yourself? So, what are you currently holding? Thank you.